Hi, today we start our next unit in criminology. So we're still unit two, but we are now moving on to topics 2.1. Now this is a huge topic, huge topic. So it's going to take us at least two weeks to be able to get through the, the main arguments. You also need to make sure you've got full notes on all these sections of so all the different studies I'm going to now present, all the different names, all the different examples. Obviously, you need to do your research as you have been doing, which is brilliant. So this is now looking at the biological theories behind why and how people become criminals. So can we explain criminality through biological features? So we're going to look at physiological and genetic. So this, because this topic is so so big this is part one so there will be a part two coming so part one is physiological part two is going to be genetic so let's get started Okay, so theories of criminality, unit 2, 2.1. These are the biological theories and we're going to start with the physiological. So I'll let you just pop your title down. And this is part one. Okay, so the introduction to this topic then, this section is about why people become criminals. Why are some people prone to criminal behaviour and others are not? And we look at the biological explanations. So the biological explanations do with their body, so physiological and genetic. So you're going to think about as you are going through this topic, what might it mean to say someone is born criminal? Do you think somebody can be born a criminal? Do crimes run in families? Do you think this is possible? And why do you think this is? So do you think criminal activity is, is inherited, is a family thing? And why does drinking alcohol sometimes lead, uh, sometimes lead to crime? What sorts of criminal behaviour do you associate with alcohol? So these are some of the sorts of questions that we're going to be exploring through this topic. So if you just want to write down your initial ideas, initial thoughts for that one, that's brilliant. So do you think that it runs in families? Do you think people are born criminal? Do you think alcohol leads to crime and is there certain types of crimes it leads to? <laughs> All right, so what will we study in this big topic? We're going to look at the physiological explanations. So these are physical differences. So physiological, make sure you spell it right. So physiological is your physio. So if you went to a physiotherapy, it's to do with your body. So it's physical differences um, that make some people more prone um, or susceptible to criminal behaviour. The ideas we're going to look at are Lombroso and Sheldon. You have to know about these two men you have to know about their studies you're going to have to memorize them and learn them and later apply them very very important names we will also look at brain abnormalities damage disease and biochemical variations Ooh. we also then in the second in the part two we look at genetic explanations so these focus on your genes and how the combination of genes how your genes work together that might cause criminality. We look at Jacob's XYY study and we also look at twin and adoption studies. So we look at twins to look at genetics, we look at um, adoption studies to see if it's upbringing more than genetics. So we'll have a look at those as well. So let's get started. So this now, oh, for the rest of this PowerPoint, for the rest of this now is physiological. Genetics is part two, which is a separate PowerPoint, separate uh, pre-recorded lesson that will come available when you need it. So we are starting with the physiological explanation. This is Lombroso, 1876. Now, you don't need to remember your dates, but I do think it's important to recognise when these studies were taking place. So 1876, we're talking about quite a significant time ago there. So he'll have been able to do studies and tests that we maybe aren't allowed to do today. He was an Italian doctor. Is that going to go away? Yes. He was an Italian doctor. He says criminals are physically 
Sorry, folks. Um, criminals are physically different to other people. They are atavistic. Now, you need to know that word, atavistic, which means they're less developed by evolution. So he believes that criminals are physically, they look physically different. They are a separate subspecies of human. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? A separate subspecies of human. They are less in control and less sensitive to pain. That's why he argued they get more tattoos. If any of you know someone that gets lots and lots of tattoos, uh, that's quite a funny argument to present to them, that Lombroso thinks that because they suffer, uh, feel less pain. Um, he studied prisoners. He studied the faces of prisoners living and dead. Wait for it. Wait for it. Living and dead. There are some of the heads of the dead that he looked at. I hope you're not eating your breakfast while you're doing this. So, what does Lombroso's research find? He attempted a scientific approach. That's very, very important. He isn't just stabbing in the dark here. He did attempt a scientific approach to analysing crime. One of the first to do so. He was one of the first to actually look at a scientific approach to analysing crime. Before this, or before him, most explanations were religious or moralistic, so that criminals basically were sinners. You are a sinner. There was no explanation for it. It was just that you are a sinner. Um, whereas Lombroso tried to come up with a way of actually looking scientifically at it. He systematically measured and recorded facial and other physical features of convicted criminals. He concluded that criminals could be identified by their physical features, their physiological. So again, what he is saying is, is that it's nothing to do with the fact that they are sinners. They are not moving away from God or breaking the Ten Commandments. There's something physically about them that you can spot. You can spot criminals and this isn't just what he's saying about the tattoos he's saying the tattoos because they feel less pain but he says actually physically certainly the facial features you can see signs or similarities between criminals so what are those similarities between criminals these are the physical features Lombroso identified he says that criminals have large jaws they have low sloping foreheads long arms, prominent eyebrow arches, excellent eyesight. So those were the common features that he found in criminals. Okay. Large jaw, low sloping forehead, long arms, Prominent eyebrow arches and excellent eyesight. You're all now thinking of people that you know that have those features, aren't you? I know I did. Um, let's see where he goes with this. He even attributed certain physical features to those who commit certain types of crime. He says murderers have beak-like noses and curly hair. He says sex offenders have thick lips and protruding ears and thieves have flattened noses. I can't make this stuff up. Um, I, can't, I, I, I can't say even without a smile because it is quite... It is quite amusing. Um, obviously, his his research and his studies trying to find the scientific root and cause um, or similarities between criminals is, is excellent. For him to move it beyond the religious sinners is just what was necessary. But we have to remember that, as I said, it was done in 1876. This was his research. He did look at the common features, but, he, but it was very shallow. What we also got to think about is maybe this is the features of most of the men in his day and age, maybe. Maybe these are things that was quite common, you know, as we, as the generations change. You know, for example, people are a lot taller now. So as generations change, their physical features change as well. That obviously needs to be taken into consideration. But turn around to say murderers have curly hair. That's just quite amusing, really. So what are the implications of these positive and negative? What are you thinking about these? Re the, about what he's found? Do you think there's some truth to it? Do you think that um, can can you see some some element of positive? 
uh, you know, truth behind what he's saying? Is this is this is the reliability here? So, what do you think about his um, about his studies about what he's found? So Lombroso's theory continued. Although there are lots of issues and problems with the theory, I've just said a few, there may be some support for the, the idea that physical features may be linked to criminality. A Chinese university study showed that artificial intelligence computers can identify criminals using facial recognition software. The identity photos of eight of... Um, uh, 1,856 people were fed into the programme, half of whom were convicted criminals. 83% of the real criminals were identified. Only 6% of the innocent people were incorrectly identified. That's pretty interesting. That is pretty interesting. So artificial intelligence that was programmed to recognise those features that Lombroso said as criminal, when putting in a random selection, half criminal, half not criminal, of 1,856 people, that's quite a massive amount, that 83% were identified as criminals using, like Lombroso's checklist, so using those ideas, 83 were were um, accurately identified as criminals, only 6% actually were, mis, were mislinked, only 6 were um, were identified wrongly, 6%. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. So, that's Lombroso's theory. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know any more detail because obviously it's pretty detailed, but you, you just need to know it on the basics. So you need to write all that down and learn that. But what we're going to do is we're also going to evaluate Lombroso now. So in a few topics time, when it gets to topic 3.2, so we're all still unit two, of course, but 3.2, you're meant to evaluate each of the people you've looked at. So rather than leaving all of that evaluation to the end we're going to do it as we go along so we're actually going to evaluate um lombroso now even though it will come up in a separate topic rather than this one so when this comes up in an exam you will just get an explain or describe question for lombroso um, or biological features etc uh, or about a study that looks at physicality you will get a general describe evaluate and then later on you'll get an uh, an evaluate question um but we're going to do the work now so that you can start keeping your notes and things together so what does it mean to evaluate? Now, this might seem really obvious, but actually evaluation is a very, very difficult skill to do. It's a very, very hard thing to learn. Um, and certainly when you've been used to being told what to think, what to write, what to argue, what to believe at school. So this is where you now start to develop your own opinion. This is where you start to develop um, what you think. So it's a higher level skill that students at level three develop. It goes beyond describing. So you look at strengths and weaknesses, does it work? Does it not work? This is a strength. This is a weakness. This might involve looking at what evidence there is to support or contradict an idea. So is there evidence that goes against it? And is that evidence more convincing? And criticisms that might come from other points of view. And coming to a balanced and reasoned conclusions about the usefulness of the idea. That's very important. You're drawing conclusions that are backed up. Your conclusions are just it's out of date, it doesn't work, we, you would need to back that up more, you need to explain why the age of something then would affect it, so because they were allowed to do uh, tests under different conditions than they are now, that the, their scientific control is, is less than what we do today in the vigorous circumstances that we apply for scientific studies, so you would need to explain that properly and justify it. So, e.g., in terms of crime, a theory might explain some kinds of crime better than others. So, you compare them, which theories of crime are better than others. So, let's have a look at Lombroso. What are the strengths of Lombroso? The strengths, first of all, was that he was the first to take a scientific objective approach to understand crime using evidence. So he was the first. So of course, there's going to be issues because he was the first, but he was pioneering this. You know, he was the first to start this. It shows the importance of examining medical and historical records of criminals. 
He's arguing that criminals may not be freely choosing their behaviour, which helped us focus on crime prevention rather than crime punishment. So because these people might not be able to help it, then it's more about how to actually help them than punish them. He argued that prisoners are like crime universities, that prisons, sorry, are like crime universities. We have high rates of reoffending. Um, so he was very perceptive. So he was very perceptive means he could really see things, the reality of things. So even though he was, you know, over a hundred years ago, well over a hundred years ago now, um, he was very perceptive with what he saw. And and calling prisons crime universities is basically meaning that people reoffend. They're constantly going back to university. Research by Butcher and Taylor 2007 shows a person's attractiveness does affect how they are to be considered guilty. Um, so again, that's very interesting that um, maybe it's something evolution again in us that we are more attracted to attractive people, that maybe more attractive people we think are less likely to um, do these crimes. But then maybe that's why Ted Bundy and people like that got away with it for so long, because he was attractive, he was a flirt, etc. He was very charismatic that people didn't think he could do what he did. The weaknesses, however, subsequent research by Goring, 1913, has shown um, has not shown a link between facial features and crime. So Goring actually had a competing study that showed it does not link to facial features. Lombroso failed to compare his research on criminals with a control group of non-criminals. So he might have found the same characteristics among general population. Now, this is extremely important. He only looked at the common features, common features within prisoners he never then compared them results with non-prisoners or non-criminals so he might have actually found that non-criminals also had long arms curly hair hooded eyebrows or whatever it was so he he, he might have found that actually that they're not just in prisoners they're in non not, not just in criminals in non-criminals as well but he never compared so that's a really important um lack of evidence it's a form of racism to say criminals are like primitive savages, cavemen. Also, Delisi, 2012, so a recent study, points out that a lot of the features deemed atavistic by Lombroso are specific to people of African descent. So quite common features with certain descent of people, which again could be seen as racist. Not all people have atavistic features are criminals and not all criminals have atavistic features. So some people that are criminals have these features. So you'll probably know people that have long arms. You'll probably know people that have, um, you know, large foreheads, etc. It doesn't mean they're criminals. And on the same side, you there'll be maybe criminals that, that don't have any of them features. So it's, it's not um, a one size fits all argument. All right, so your turn. This is the end of your first lesson. So this is the end of the first section. I would now like you to research these two things. So these two things, please, I would like you to research ready for your next lesson. So your turn. I want you to research the second physiological theory of criminality of Sheldon. I want you to find out how Sheldon believed criminality is linked to physical features. What did he mean by somatypes? Uh, what are they and how do they relate to crime? And finally, was there any evidence to support his theory? So the evaluation section. Second of all, I want you to research brain abnormalities. So I want you to look up the case of Phineas Gage. What a good name. What happened to him and what were the consequences? So that's your research, please. That's what I would like you to do um, for today's lesson. So you can stop the stop the uh, stop the video now. Um, the I'm going to obviously continue. So I'm going to continue going through the different sections, but you do not have to continue as that will be our next lesson's work. So for those of you doing the first section, please stop now. But we're going to continue. So next part, next section. William Sheldon. There he is. Sheldon wrote Atlas of Men in 1954, so a bit more recent than Lombroso, in which he explained his physiological theory of body types. He believed different features of our personality and behaviours are linked to our body types. So he's now linking personality and behaviours, how we act and behave, to how we physically look, including criminality. So he says there's three physical 
types, endomorphic, ectomorphic, mesomorphic. Sound like dinosaurs, don't they? So endomorphic, ectomorphic, mesomorphic. So please write them down, make sure you spell them correctly. And then I'll go into what each of them are in a second. Okay, so endomorphs is a rounder shape. So endomorphs are rounder. They tend to be relaxed and sociable. Sounds a bit like, like my lockdown body. Um, mesomorphs are muscular and gym bound. Um, they tend to be aggressive and adventurous, lacking sensitivity, uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, I can't even say that, it's sensitivity and inhibition. Ectomorph are thin and fragile, tend to be introverted and restrained. Wow, nothing much for stereotypes. Sheldon used a correlation study, correlations when you compare things, and found the group that was most likely to commit crime are mesomorphs, your muscular, with the least likely being ectomorphs. How predictable is that? What do you think about his somatypes? I think they are probably um, some of the most extreme stereotypes that I've certainly heard. Let's see where he's going to go with this. Please write all of this down there, don't forget. Sheldon's study. He asked people to rate photos on a scale of 1 to 7 according to how close to the mesomorph type each one was. So the mesomorph, they're big and muscly. Half of the photos were of college students and half were of juvenile delinquents. The delinquents had a higher average rating as mesomorphs than the college students. So do you think this proves that mesomorphs are more likely to be criminal? When people... When people... Um, identified the juvenile delinquents as being more mesomorph that then automatically associates them with being criminals because more, delin more juvenile delinquents had the muscular body type they were therefore because they were already criminals with that body type it's that body type that has made them criminals seems like a few kind of leaps of logic there in my mind a few connect the dots and see where you go can you think of any problems with this? So can you think of any problems? So as we're going through this, don't forget, think about what you think about these things. Does it work? Does it not work? Um, what questions do you have? Um, so do you think there's any problems with this theory? And of course, I'm going to share some with you now. So the strengths, some support from other studies, so Putwin and Sammons in 2002 um, also found a link between physique, so how you look. Um, I don't know why I'm, I'm trying, you know, trying to do my Master of the Universe poses there. Physique and criminality. Um, Glueck and Glueck, hopefully pronounced that one correctly. 1956 found 60% mesomorphs. Um, in their sample of delinquents, but only 31 in the sample of non-delinquents. So again, more criminals are mesomorph than not. Does that mean that because of their body type, they're more likely to be criminals, or is it just that criminals have that type of body type? Sheldon used a large sample in his study, so he used 200 and a control group as well of students. So he did compare, which is one thing that obviously Lombroso didn't do, and it had a massive sample, so 200 is a big sample. Um, so that does add some strength to his argument. However, weaknesses. But Sheldon cannot explain how endomorphs and ectomorphs can also be criminals. So we're talking about the other ones. So we're talking about how um, the, the, the sociable, rounder shapes and the skinny, fragile shapes can also be criminals. He doesn't explain that. 
people's bodies change throughout their lives um, quite often certainly with teenagers teenage boys uh, um, they might have the you know the the very slim physiques and then bulk out um, as they you know as testosterone etc so your bodies change over time uh, lockdown has changed my body I'm convinced so you know this doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to become a criminal or do criminal activity because your body has changed Maybe because mesomorphs look the way they do, they are invited or dared to do more illegal acts or labelling. So if somebody is more mesomorph, so more bulky or muscular, do people actually start on them more, for example? Do they invite them to kind of start more fights or more aggression and things like that? Maybe it's not that they're aggressive personalities. Maybe that actually they're just taken into situations where this happens. <laughs> Could it be cause bias and labelling of mesomorphs? So again, the, you know, how it said about the attractiveness, that um, attractiveness is, is judged when looking at guilty or not. Maybe we look at the way that someone looks as well as to whether they are guilty or not. And maybe social class causes offending and uh, mesomorphy. This idea of criminals are more likely to be working class males who tend to do manual jobs. So needing a more athletic build. So working class males um, doing more manual work will mean that they will build bigger muscles. They will build that frame. Um, so maybe this is a social class thing. It doesn't mean that they're going to be more criminals. It's just to do with, again, the jobs that they have. Also, not only do people's bodies change throughout their lives, body image changes over time um, and culture. So, for example, through my lifetime, it was very, very popular for a female to, to be like Kate Moss. When I was growing up, the Kate Moss image was very, very popular, this extremely slender, um, very, very thin image image for a female so that would be the you know the fragile thin frame that was what was very popular when I was growing up and now it's far more the curvy woman the, the Beyonce etc the Kim Kardashian the JLo etc the far more curvier female which again would be the rounder shape so actually it, it's it also is affected by culture and it's also affected by you know the time it's in as well so this the body body image is very subjective so it's so yes maybe at that time when um sheldon did the study that more criminals had the bigger frames uh, but was that just because of a time and a culture thing rather than the, the, that that's what made them be criminals so is there a link there between bodies and criminals you again this is something that you need to think about and see what you think <laughs> all right so an exam style question then to discuss describe a physiological theory of criminality so uh, just have a little go at this question just as a break uh, break up your information so describe a physiological theory of criminality think about what you would include you would either choose Lombroso or Sheldon you would not need to do both and um, and you do not need to evaluate them either in this question so you just need four marks so you need to say what physiological is um, and then basically what Lombroso or Sheldon found give an example so you do not need to evaluate you do not need to use them both okay so the last section for your second lesson. So this isn't, uh, so please do keep going. I know there's, as I said, there is a lot for this topic, but you need to keep going, please. So the last three sections that we're going to look at are brain abnormality, disease, and biochemical explanation. So these are also other biological theories. Brain abnormality, so you don't need to kind of jot that down or anything, but it is important that you understand what's going on in this image. So prefrontal cortex is the bit at the front of your brain. Um, the limbic brain is connected with it, uh, um, and that's the fight, flight, freeze, stress response, thinks am I safe, do people want me, and emotions live in there. Um, and your prefrontal cortex, the bit at the front, has nine functions. That front part, front part of your brain is so important. Empathy, insight, response, flexibility, emotion, body regulation, morality, intuition, uh, attuned communication and fear um, modulation so um, these parts are very very important for your behaviors some people argue that crime is related to damage to the prefrontal cortex of the brain so again have a look at summarize what that picture is showing you what that brain part of that brain does 
Um, this is linked to rationality and self-control. So again, how might this relate to criminal behaviour? If that part's damaged, how might that then link to criminal behaviour? So just make sure you summarise that picture and jot down an answer to that question. So why do people think the prefrontal cortex might play a role? Rain et al, don't forget et al means and others. So Rain et al, 1994, used PET, um, positron emission tomography scans. These were radioactive traces, um, oh sorry, radioactive traces are absorbed into the bloodstream, so something's put into the bloodstream, and they monitor and create a 3D image of active cells, so you can see what's going on and what cells are active, etc., by using like these uh, traces. Brains of convicted killers compared to normal brains, so people that don't kill. They found killers had damage to that prefrontal cortex. So there was some damage there um, that they found in killers. Dr. James Fallon uh, has also compared brains of normal and psychopathic people. He found significant differences. And again, we will explore those later. So, the strange case of Phineas Gage. Oh, I didn't mean to rhyme that one. What happened? Obviously, done a little bit of research last lesson. So um, make sure that you, um, you know, keep those notes because there will be an activity at the end. But that is a very, very good example for your frontal cortex. So that's where Phineas Gage, uh, Phineas Gage sorry, will come into it. <laughs> Disease. Some studies show a connection between disease and antisocial behaviour. For example, in the 1920s, it saw an epidemic of, here we go, encephalitis lethargica. I definitely know the lethargica, lethargic tiredness, lethargica, encephalitis, F encephalitis, let's go with that. Oh, I could be a doctor. Um, in children, also known as sleepy sickness. Encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain, so your your brain gets uh, swells, it's an inflammation, it's, it's an irritation of the brain normally caused by a virus. This is also said to have led to impulsiveness, aggression and abnormal sexual behaviour afterwards in those that had the disease. So the final section then is biochemical. There are four different... Uh, uh, ideas that we can link to biochemicals. So these are chemicals or hormones things in your body. The first obviously is testosterone. Um, if you look at the graph there of mice, so this is mice and aggression, when they're pre-castration, so before they've had their bits snipped, um, very, very high biting attacks after they've had the snip, very, very low attacks. And then again, the, the, the testosterone kind of builds up, but not quite as bad. Um, and so this is the idea that testosterone can cause potentially aggression. Uh, but again, is there any limitations to using that study? What limitations can you spot with that study? Um, Ellis and uh, Kuntz, Kuntz um, found a correlation between the age of testosterone peaks in human males, so early 20s, and age range with highest crime level. So basically, early 20s are the highest criminals. Not sure uh, with that one either. But basically, that testosterone, so high levels of testosterone, again, cause that aggression. Maybe that's linked in with the muscle as well, because I think that when you have large amounts of muscles, you have more testosterone, potentially in order to build the muscle. Maybe don't write that one down, and maybe I'm making these up but I think there might be a link there. So that might, be, you know, link to the Sheldon idea as well of the summer, says, uh, summer type, sorry. In males, high levels of testosterone has been linked with aggression, aggressive crimes such as rape and murder. Female hormones. In women who are premenstrual, made premenstruation before their periods, postnatal depressions so after they've had a baby, their hormones dip, and breastfeeding have all been used as defences for crimes ranging from shoplifting to infanticide. Infanticide is killing your child. Uh, infant, killing your infant. This is based on the idea that the female hormones involved have influenced behaviour. Low blood sugar. This is called hypoglycemia and has been associated with aggressive behaviour. 
alcohol affects your blood sugars. Alcohol actually reduces your blood sugars. And this is often then linked to aggressive aggression in crime, so aggressive crimes. Um, so could low blood sugar be a possible explanation for crimes even when there's no alcohol present though? So, um, you know, could low blood sugar, gosh, give someone a wine gum, is low blood sugar um, a cause of crime? Um, or is it just more the fact that we're looking at alcohol as being a cause of crime and alcohol causes low blood sugar? Again, what kind of leads to what? Saunders did a study finding approximately a thousand arrests per day were alcohol linked. Finally, drugs, cocaine is linked to aggression, whereas cannabis, heroin and MDMA are actually having have the opposite effect. They lower aggression. Um, some studies suggest low levels of neurotransmitter serotonin, so serotonin, uh, which is your brain chemical, it's a natural brain ke uh, chemical, are also connected with higher aggression. Um, Skirborn Rain found low, so 1993, it found low serotonin to be a factor in many studies into antisocial behaviour in adults and children. So um, this idea that if your serotonin is too low, it might be antisocial. But then again, if, if the studies suggest that if your serotonin, um, you know, so if your serotonin is too low, that this might then lead to high aggression. Serotonin levels um, are increased by eating nuts, chicken, dark chocolate and cheese. Go and eat these dark chocolate, you know, if you ever need an excuse to eat dark chocolate, oh, I could eat some dark chocolate. If any of you needed some excuse to go and eat that cheese as well, mm, bit of blue cheese, I like blue cheese, you're probably thinking, oh, horrible, uh, but yes, so increase your serotonin and therefore you are less likely to have aggressive outspells, if of obviously this has any truth to it. Final bit then, this is, there's a last couple of slides and then that's it. So I would like you now to work on this exam style question. This is a biggie, so this is a six marker. Describe how research suggests the link between brain damage and crime. So damage to a brain and crime. How would you approach this question? What would you include? Uh, um, don't worry about putting your ideas in the chat because obviously uh, we're going to do that separately. So um, more put it, put it in your ideas in your notes instead. So these are things that you might want to talk about. So um, the prefrontal cortex and how that links to that, using that image. If damage, it could lead to poor decision making, etc. It's also linked to the lim uh, limbic system. So that, that little connective bit that it, that it had for the fight or flight. Uh, Rain used the PET scans. Fallon found the evidence uh, for damage of the pre uh, temporal, temporal cortex. Uh, damage can also be through injury, illness, drugs and alcohol abuse um, by, the, by the actual person or in utero. Utero means in the womb. So if someone was had alcohol or drugs, etc., it could cause damage to that part of the brain. Um, and obviously you have Phineas Gage to support this. So um, Obviously, there's a lot of help there with the different bullet points. So all I'd like to do is just really think about how you would get your six marks for that. But again, six marks, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, you've got seven bullet points there. It is the sort of length that you would be expected to do for a six marker question. Um, you've got your example of Phineas Gage, you've got your explanation, you've got your studies. Again, you do not, it's a describe, you do not have to evaluate any of these. Um, so think about how your answer would look. Um, you're welcome just to plan it or you could write it if you want to, it depends how much time you've got, because obviously this has been quite a long video. Um, but you are looking at a good half a page for something like that. Finally then, um, the strengths and weaknesses of brain injuries and abnormalities. So the final part is the strengths and weaknesses of this section. Um, the strengths, there are cases where brain injury has led to dramatic changes in personality and behaviour. There is a correlation between abnormal EEG readings and psychopathy. So EEG readings again are readings of your brain. Uh, so the EEG there is an electrophysiological monitoring method to record electrical activity of the brain. Electroencephalography. Electroencephalography. 
I'll let you practice that one. Brain injury is more likely to have happened to prisoners than non-prisoners. So there is some strength there and there is some evidence there. Weaknesses, however, it's still rare for brain injury or disease to cause crime. Previous personality is more important. Psychopaths can also have very normal EEG patterns and non-criminals can have abnormal ones. It's not clear that the EEG patterns explain crime. Our brain injury is an effect of crime rather than a cause. So um, prisoners have a high likelihood because of getting into fights. So actually the, the brain analysis come after rather than before. So... What I would like you to do, please, I'll send I'll send you this PowerPoint so you can get your links. I just want you to watch a few of these videos uh, um, from Professor Rain, Dr. Fallon. I want you to have a look at the Phineas Gage case fully, and I'm going to email you some questions over, and I want you to watch the video about the effects of testosterone. So I appreciate this is a, a, a massive section, so I'm going to give you all of this lesson, and I'm going to let it spill into the next lesson a bit but the next lesson you will be getting part two as well so you have quite a lot of work there i appreciate so obviously use your time try and do as much as you can and um, i know that there's a lot of work there and um, so it might be that you what think right i'll watch my videos and do the questions over the weekend instead that's absolutely fine as long as it is done i trust that you are doing the work and your work that you send to me is superb absolutely superb so please keep going i know that there's a lot there though so just just you know what you need to do you know how fast you work you know what other work you have to do so just pace yourself and think right i will do that on this part i'll do that on this part but just so that you're aware that your next lesson you will be getting access to part two so it needs to be this needs to be significantly finished significantly done or you have at least planned what you're going to do when in order to keep up thanks very much everybody let me just make you smaller if you have have any questions obviously send me them in an email or um get in touch underneath in the comments otherwise um i'll be in touch shortly everyone thanks very much bye for now